Okay, it's 7.31, everybody. Good morning, and uh, thank you for attending on Zoom. Uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce to you uh, someone who I'm sure everybody knows quite well, and that's Dr. David Eidelman. Dr. Eidelman is the Vice Principal and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, a position he's had since October 2011. So he's uh, actually in the process of winding down, and there's a search on for his replacement, which is going to be quite difficult uh, to find, I'm sure. Uh, David is a Mo Montrealer, is a McGill grad, used to be the chief of uh, the Division of Respiratory Medicine and became the chief of uh, internal medicine and then uh, was uh, anointed dean in 2011. He's a clinician, teacher, scientist, researcher. Uh, his research interests are in asthma and immune mechanisms. Um, and I think one of the ways to know what type of person he is, is to actually look at the uh, proposed job description and the individual they're looking for to replace him. And I'll just read a few of the um, elements that are important for the next Dean. Needs to be a clinician, needs to be a teacher, researcher, a leader, administrator, finance, needs to be visionary, needs to have curiosity, creativity, needs to be inspirational, and needs to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, in Quebec, have some language fluency. I think it's a difficult position. It's gonna be a challenge to find someone as good as David. And I can tell you from a personal perspective, I, I looked at my emails last night. I have emails going back from 211 to most recently. And it was always very easy to get a hold of him. And uh, when I'm looking at the words and the way in which he responded always in a pleasant manner, in a positive manner, and uh, it was always a pleasure to, to work uh, alongside David in the ways in which I did. So I'd like to thank David for coming today and hopefully we'll be able to have a good discussion afterwards. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Kevin. I mean, it's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure to work with you as well. And it's been a pleasure to be in this uh, privileged position for the last 11 years. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking about um, a topic which I think is very important, um, and I've, uh, I think it's important enough that I've actually made it a talk that I've given to every uh, clinical department, uh, as well as to many leadership groups in the, uh, in the uh, faculty. And it comes out of some issues that we've had uh, across the faculty, uh, especially in the School of Medicine, but all through the faculty in terms of the learning environment. And um, um, we're calling uh, what we're doing a campaign. We're calling it Our Words Matter. So before I get started, uh, I want you to know that there uh, I have no specific conflicts for this uh, talk. Uh, all the images I'm using are used with permission or are in the public domain. And the learning objectives are to make sure that people know what we mean by learner mistreatment. Uh, make sure people know how our situation compares with the literature, such as it is. And I wanna say some things about how I think we can improve our performance. So it's grand rounds. So I feel compelled to have some cases. So the cases I'm presenting today are all cartoons. None of them are real cases. They're all uh, close to real cases. And I've, uh, I've abstracted the key elements and kind of changed all these, the facts to make sure that the, it doesn't point fingers at any single person, but they, they epitomize some of the issues we're facing. So first case, there's a student presenting a, a cardiology case to a visiting senior staff member from another university. And the student is asked the question about the case and they're so nervous that they inadvertently mix up the right and left sides of the heart. They just say something dumb. And in front of everyone, the visitor comments, I can't believe you did that. What medical school did you go to? Or here's another case, it's more recent. So as a resident, she wears a hijab, she's seen a patient in clinic. She now has to present her findings to the attending. And the attending and the, and the resident walk into the examination room to see the patient. And as the resident begins her presentation about the case, the attending turns to the patient and asks, what do you think about Quebec's new law banning religious symbols in education and health? So these are both examples of where the learner has been put on the spot. And our learners report high rates of negative experiences in the learning environment. There's a lot of a lot of reports of mistreatment, and you know belittlement, bullying, racism, sexism. 
So what do I mean by mistreatment? So we have a new, a relatively new office, the Office of Res Respectful Environments. It has a website. And on the website, there is a specific definition of what our faculty means by mistreatment. Learner mistreatment is defined as disrespectful or unprofessional behavior directed at a learner or group of learners that has a negative effect on the learner or learning environment. Mistreatment is any conduct that is contrary to the principles that support a respectful environment and includes making demeaning, offensive, belittling, and disrespectful comments, using abusive language, engaging in bullying, harassment, or discrimination. Now, I know I'm coming to you at a bad time. I mean, it's a bad time for the healthcare system. It's, it, in many ways, it's a bad time for society. We're still, you know, we were just commenting that it's like going to be three years in, in March. On March 13th, it'll be three years of uh, official pandemic. It's more than that in terms of biological pandemic. Uh, we still have sh staff shortages everywhere. Uh, there are huge demographic pressures on our healthcare system that uh, you guys know much better than I do. We have long delays for things. There's still supply chain issues. Inflation is a problem, especially for uh, working class people. The war in Ukraine has disrupted markets around the world, not to mention uh, all the horror that goes with that and all the other problems that you know. On top of that, our young people are oppressed by, a, a, there's a culture of perfectionism. Um, and they are doing so in a, in a time when social media is so prominent. And we know that social media is having a negative effect on people's mental health and uh, it can really be toxic. So this is a really fraught moment. Look, working in healthcare right now is hard. And you could ask a question, why am I coming to you about this now and adding to the burden. Oh, you, you guys are, many people are, are already feeling really overwhelmed. Well, unfortunately, there's a practical reason. The practical reason has to do with the fact that we are running training programs. We have undergraduate medicine, we have postgraduate medicine, and we have accreditation risks. Uh, as many will remember, we, we, we were unsatisfactory on the element concerning mistreatment on the last survey, uh, and we continue to be unsatisfactory. Remember that we were on probation uh, for undergraduate medicine in 2014. Um, in postgrad, we have major programs that were either on the cusp or, or, or uh, at risk of losing their accreditation and being closed because of learner mistreatment. And that that is not in one department or another. That's been in multiple departments. So this is this is this is a very serious problem, and and we've had to address it over the last uh, decade more than once, and we're still working on it. So our progress is slow. We we've made many many efforts to improve, but we're still not there. So as I said, you know, undergraduate medicine, the MD program was on probation. We we've improved things, the curriculum, the preclinical. We've done all kinds of stuff, but mistreatment is still an issue still an issue. This is not good. It sometimes makes the newspaper. And some of you will have seen a similar thing happen to University of Montreal recently where their psychiatry program made the newspaper. You know, So these things get to be public. Um, in addition to being, of course, miserable for whatever service or group is on probation, or as we say in, in postgrad, intention to withdraw, this stuff uh, leaks into the press and really affects our reputation. The last MDCM accreditation update, we were once again unsatisfactory in learner mistreatment. In this case, it was, it was a lot about <clears throat> making sure we have the mechanisms in place that to work towards improving the learning environment. The creditors want to make sure we have a plan and that the learners have the best possible opportunity to, to learn in the right kind of environment. So how are we doing, in fact? So this is medical student feedback. It's I personally, this is on a, a survey that's given out uh, by the faculty on a regular basis. And it's, I personally mis, uh, experienced mistreatment. You can see have four years of medicine and from 2016 to 2021 when we were doing the survey. And there's a couple of things that I wanna point out. First of all, some years are worse than others. This year there was almost no mistreatment. The next year there was a lot in the same class, the same level. Um, but one thing is clear is that as students go through the, th the four years, by the time they get to fourth year, almost half the class has said they've experienced mistreatment. That's a lot. That's a lot. When we ask them, like, 
where where is this coming from? So this is from data in the Office for Respectful Environments for for the last uh, from between April 21 and December 22. You can see that most of the cases are staff physicians, but the second most common one is another student, right? So students, it's not only that the I mean, of course, as as staff, it's our responsibility to get to be, to be, to get this under control. But there is an issue among students and, of course, between residents and students. There are other things, nurses and so on, but these are minor. When we look by class, very important to see that in Med 1 and Med 2, there's really not too many complaints. But once you get to Med 3 and Med 4, you start to see a lot of complaints, especially about staff. The other thing that happens is they go through school. They become more aware of how to complain but they become less and less comfortable complaining at a time where there are more complaints. So what does this say? This says that not only are they uh, feeling that they're in an environment that isn't uh, conducive to learning, but they're scared. They don't want to report. And we get comments like these. C'est très facile pour un membre de la faculté de savoir qui l'a signalé, surtout à Gatineau, où nous sommes un petit groupe. I have no confidence that there won't be further repercussions after reporting. I have not reported an issue, but I'm worried that my confidentiality will not be respected. And these are comments from medical students, but I can tell you I've had the same comments from residents. Okay, it's not the, the, the exact same comments. So these are the numbers uh, uh, up till December. You can see a couple of things. These are the number of complaints. So I showed you the med students before. So there's, there's 55 complaints from med students, but there's 175 complaints more or less from uh, residents and fellows. And for residents and fellows, it really is in PGY1 to PGY3, PGY4. It tapers off after that, partly because the number of learners goes down, but also because by the time someone gets to PGY5, they have a certain degree of autonomy in most programs. And so uh, they're a little less, uh, they feel it less. But certainly in the first three to four years of residency across different programs, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of complaints. And, uh, you know, this, this is very concerning. So what kind of complaints am I talking about? Well, public humiliation is the most common one where a resident or a student feels that they, you know, they present something and like in, in the first case, instead of just saying, well, have you thought of this? Or it's, uh, you know, uh, where'd you go to medical school? Yelling. Unfortunately, especially for med students, we've had issues related to one of the official languages. We've had francophones being told they don't speak English well enough. We've had anglophones being told they don't speak French well enough. Not in a productive and supportive way, but rather in a, you know, get off my service way. In that regard, we've had rudeness, unprofessional actions of various kinds, general harassment. A common one is where learners get blamed because the supervisor, usually a staff, but or a resident, has come up with a disorganized or bad plan, and then when it doesn't work out, they blame the, the, the junior person, the student or the junior resident. And another one that unfortunately is also common is, especially for med students, is learners being singled out by just ignoring them, deciding they're not good, and you, won't, you don't ask them questions, you don't talk to them, you just sort of freeze them out. Unfortunately, uh, it, I would have thought it was rare, but it is not rare. Racial and ethnic comments, comments about someone's appearance. Very common is to presume someone's incompetent because where they're from rather than their actual skills. We have reports of sexual mistreatment, inappropriate touching. Uh, people, believe it or not, in the 21st century are still calling female colleagues princess uh, when they're not members of royalty. Uh, this is this is just not, not acceptable. So here's some examples. These again are cartoons, so <laughs> these are not like taken. They're they're adapted from reality, but to give you an idea. So a resident is scrubbed into a case and is operating under the supervision of an attending. The resident is struggling, and rather than guiding the resident, the attending says, "Hurry up! I'm not paid to watch you operate." Uh, student. Uh, this is actually the, uh, the text got lost down there, but this is from the literature. I don't care if I get something wrong. I get, I'm wrong all the time, but if you make me feel like I'm an idiot for getting something wrong, 
or if you make me feel if you make me feel like, oh, you're stupid, you should have known that. That's not good. This is unfortunately from our own database. In a meeting with a group of students, the instructor seeks the student for the first time without procedure masks. The instructor confuses a student for someone else. And rather than apologize and rectify the situation, the instructor tries to joke that all black students look alike. And no one in the group calls, calls this out or tries to ensure the safety of the student. Another one, it's unfortunately common. Most residents are at a Pan McGill uh, ARM day and attendings overheard to say that they're happy there's less teaching. It's a relief not to have to do useless academic tasks like filling out those stupid EPAs. This one, you're on rounds with the medical students on your team and you, and you like to you know, get to know them, include some small talk. And the student is presenting a case and you interrupt the case to say, it's an unusual name. Where are you from? So these are all examples of situations in which learners are felt to find themselves felt to be on the outside. So how do we compare? So the literature is very incomplete. I did just as a, I, I typed in student mistreatment into PubMed, I got 28 publications. Now there are other publications, it's not the whole world's literature, but it just gives you a sense of how small the literature is. Um, most of the publications are uh, like series, a uh, few students, it's not really big numbers. 40, but overall, Quite like we have here at McGill, about 40 to 60% of learners report experiencing mistreatment at some point during their training. The numbers, like here, the numbers increase at Med 3, and they remain high through residency. And like here, they're underreported because of fear of retribution. So I guess, in a sense, we should be relieved. We're just like everybody else, but I'm not sure this is something to be proud of. The biggest study I found was uh, based on questionnaires um, that were done uh, among students. It was published in JAMA Internal Medicine uh, about three years ago. Uh, and they were interested in um, subgroups. So assessment of prevalence of medical student mistreatment by sex, race and ethnicity and sexual orientation. And um, they basically had all the students who graduated in the United States in 2016 and 2017. So, their point was that it's not just students in general, it's some students. So they looked at the prevalence of at least one episode of mistreatment according to what was reported in the survey. And if you were female, it was almost twice as likely if, if you were male. If you were from an underrepresented group, and in this American survey, this means black and Hispanic, uh, you were much more likely than if you were from a white male, you were up to almost 40%. If you were from a minority sexual orientation, um, Again, 40%. And when they asked, did you ever experience gender discrimination? In other words, where you were disfavored because of your gender, uh, unsurprisingly, three times as many uh, female uh, identifying people as versus male identifying people complained of gender discrimination. So the literature also talks about what are the risk factors for the perception of mistreatment? Like what? So a key element is the tone of the teacher. So you remember that case I just presented and I talked about, you know, asking someone where they're from. Well, if everyone's sitting around, I don't know, having coffee and saying where they're from, it's perfectly normal to say, and where are you from? It's a normal thing to do. But if the person is in the middle of a case presentation and is trying their best and is very nervous and you interrupt them and throw them off, it makes them feel like they, they don't belong there because they have a funny name. The way you transmit information to a student or a resident, the same words with the right tone can be very positive or can be very, very negative. And in particular, when there's a perception that the comments are purposefully intended to induce embarrassment and you're picking on someone or when it's perceived that you're picking on someone. And again, especially when it occurs in front of peers, um, we know that this is more likely to happen during a medical or surgical procedure. And so this is the Department of Surgery, you have a lot of procedures. And so it makes it, I actually think that the challenge for, for surgery or other procedural disciplines is actually much harder 
than it is for, I don't know, geriatrics or something like that, or uh, uh, public health, uh, because you have a lot of very tense moments where uh, a small movement in one way or another can be a big mistake. And so it's, I think it's very tough to be a, uh, a supervisor in a surgical discipline, but we have to find ways of helping learners without putting them uh, on the back foot all the time. Otherwise they won't approve. The other thing in literature, there, there, there's, there are books on this. Why should we care about this? Maybe, you know, if it's a hostile environment, it builds toughness. And in people, you know, in the, in the old days, we had Dr. So-and-so and he was really tough, but I survived and now look at me, I'm great. Um, well, there is a literature about this. And what happens in a hostile environment is not good. Uh, people don't listen well in a hostile environment because they feel uh, stress all the time. Most importantly, they're less engaged. People don't think of their job. Uh, they think that they're going to work like they're you know, uh, doing any other job. They don't see medicine as a calling when, the, when the, it's unpleasant to work in a place. And it's very hard to have team spirit when uh, it's a hostile environment. You know, shifting from the idea of a, a, a team or I'm the team leader into what's in it for me. And most importantly, job satisfaction is reduced. People don't enjoy working in a place where everybody's, uh, or it's a hostile environment. So, you know, we, 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 there's also clues that when the environment is hostile for learners, it means it's hostile for everybody, and it's bad for patients. Patient care suffers because, of course, people don't work as well when they're under these kind of stresses. There are contributing factors that you know. I said at the beginning, everyone stretched, uh, especially in, uh, in, in some disciplines. I know that in surgery, uh, the lays and getting OR time for patients, long waiting lists, things like this, those are incredibly stressful and frustrating. We know that in Canada, burnout now is over 50%. Uh, for uh, It says here 30 for 50% for Canadian MDs, but the most recent surveys since the pandemic over 50% burnout uh, symptoms among Canadian doctors, and the same thing for Canadian learners. So people are really at, at, at the limit of what they can tolerate. And this is, this is not anybody's fault uh, here, it's reality, but it means that we have to be extra careful. One thing I would remind attendings and senior residents who are teaching medical students is that the competition for specialties among medical students now is at a frenzy and at a level that is unbelievable. It was always competitive, even in ancient times when I was a student, but uh, nothing like it is now. And, you, and this is part of where the friction between uh, students on student friction comes from. This is really, really difficult. And I have to say surgical disciplines are among those in which the competition is most fierce. Everybody wants to be, I don't know, a plastic surgeon or a dermatologist or an ophthalmologist or various uh, very popular specialties. And there's like one position a year or two positions a year. And this is particularly bad in Quebec where we have the PREM system uh, and very limited numbers, but it's not that much different in the rest of Canada. Or in fact, Canada is worse than the United States because, um, because of the, uh, the difficulty just to get into med school in the first place. And in addition, there's another dimension to consider. The world has changed. I remember being a student in this organization many, many years ago. Nobody talked about these things, but now everybody talks about EDI, anti-racism. This is a normal thing now in shaping our society and our work environments. And it's our responsibility to ensure that our environment is welcoming to a diverse staff and faculty. We do have diverse staff and faculty and students. We need to make sure our EDI is prioritized and discrimination is not present. Now you're thinking, yeah, we all talk about EDI. This is, yeah, but does this really happen here? Yeah, it really happens here. So I have personally, during the pandemic, had to deal with crises about Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, to a lesser extent, indigenous and uh, racism and discrimination, anti-black racism and other forms of discrimination. And I would remind those who are of a younger generation that our faculty, McGill University and this hospitals or these hospitals, the General, the Vic, the Children's, 
We had a history of official racism and anti-Semitism that went back to the 19th century until the 1950s. Okay, so this is this is an organization or a set of organizations that don't have a great history in this area. So my, my view is that we are compelled to do better. Uh, you know, we had, there were, we found a, 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 um, documents of, in the dean's notes of how many Jews were to be allowed into the class, like there was a deal made about how many, how few Jews we could we could get away with, and we know that black medical students couldn't rotate in certain hospitals because they weren't allowed to touch patients, so they they weren't allowed to be they weren't allowed to you know this was stuff that really happened and it happened here, so it's not like some theoretical thing. We not everything was black, you know we had good things too. We had uh, we had, uh, we've admitted black students into our medical school in, from the middle of the 19th century, even had a black department head in the middle of the 19th century in pharmacology. Uh, we had, uh, you know, many, many prominent uh, Jewish uh, professors and so on. But believe me, it was not good. And those were the main minority groups at the time. Obviously, there are more now. The issues are slightly different, but the principle is the same. We have to be welcoming to everyone. So how can we do better? Well, the faculty has tried a bunch of stuff. We have a mistreatment uh, task force and framework. We, we're gonna hear about the Office for Respectful Environments. Uh, the chairs have developed a chairs guide. There's all kinds of stuff. There's an action plan against anti-black racism, uh, which reinforces the university's plan. You will notice that the university recently has a whole initiative on anti-Semitism and, anti and Islamophobia, which is, uh, which is actually quite impressive. Uh, there's been multiple concerned uh, consultations with concerned groups. We put out statements in our in 2022, so we're doing all kinds of things. But the biggest thing we've done, and we're still doing, is to try and send a message that learners have an opportunity, they have a place to go, should there be a problem. So I'm very pleased to be here with uh, my senior advisor, Liam Moss who is going to talk in a second about the Office for Respectful Environments. I want, I, like Kevin was very, uh, very generous in describing me when I started. So I'm going to be generous in describing Leah. So Leah uh, is really played an extraordinary role in getting this office going, but getting many, many other things. She has a PhD in education and she's supposed to be advising me, but mostly she just tells me what we have to do uh, when it comes to education things. And we're very, very fortunate to have her on our team. So uh, Leah. Over to you. Goodness. Thank you, Dean Eidelman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to speak to you about the Office for Respectful Environments. Uh, so this office uh, was created uh, in April 2021, after a series of consultations uh, involving both medical students, residents, and some attendings. And uh, the point of today is to reemphasize that this office was launched at the same time that the university was launching their own system, a revised system called the Office for Mediation and Reporting. So the reason that I, I bring that up is that the university is taking uh, issues of harassment, sexual violence, uh, issues of belittlement, et cetera, um, and racism very seriously. As the Dean mentioned, we are in a different time in a different context where uh, these conversations need to happen. So I encourage everyone on the call to take a moment and visit this website if you can. Uh, the reason is, is that you should become familiar with what, your, uh, what learners and trainees have access to. Um, perhaps you are familiar with the legacy system and we want to re-emphasize that that legacy system no longer exists. So the legacy system was the red apple and the green apple system which some of you may be familiar with. And what we heard anecdotally uh, on the, on the, in the clinical environment was something would happen. It was a stressful situation and someone would say, well, whatever, red apple me, I don't care. Um, the initial intention was to make a red apple less threatening uh, than saying a report of mistreatment. The unintended effect of using euphemisms is that we haven't been able to have very uh, straightforward conversations where we really destigmatize the issues around 
everyone may be having a bad day. So um, here's what the website looks like when you enter it. Uh, the first box is very important. What we heard from our focus groups is that many trainees aren't actually sure what constitutes mistreatment. And um, the Dean mentioned that he conducted a lit review. I'm actually doing a secondary lit review right now so that you know, we maintain our, our quality improvement of what we're doing in this area. And most of the studies now are around that issue, that trainees are, have a a wide variability understanding of what constitutes mistreatment. So we have a definition, but we also have examples on the website. Uh, the second box is to report mistreatment. And this is an, a confidential online uh, system to report. It's slightly different for UGME than PGME trainees because the PGME trainees ask for very specific uh, things in the reporting system, such as whether or not they could, uh, we could send a report to their program director um, and to be very clear that there was a date by which um, we could take action. The huge issues of fears of retribution contributed to the system for uh, PGME trainees. And lastly, support resources, because of course it is, it's, it's always stressful um, when uh, something happens and, and you're not sure uh, if you were in the wrong, if someone else was in the wrong, and maybe you need to talk about it a little bit further. So, um, so we have the, that support resource. So in August 2022, um, we launched a, a program that was based on uh, what we were hearing in the narratives, which was um, UGME students in particular felt like they really needed to speak to a human being, which we completely understand and can appreciate. So we launched what was a pilot project, and, and now it's a full project, where we have an academic director. In this case, it's Dr. Abe Fuchs, who is former dean. And the purpose of this academic director role is to meet with the students. Um, this is an individual with uh, no, um, no context of teaching students or, or evaluation, and they act as a neutral party. We also have a, a, a Dr. Boudreau, who is working with the trainees in, in Campus Utewe. So the purpose of meeting with the academic director is to help uh, the trainee navigate the situation that they're going through. Um, what we have heard from attendings, especially as it relates to PGME, is there are many attendings who are uh, not comfortable providing constructive feedback to trainees because they feel that they will be then reported for an issue of mistreatment if they give a trainee negative feedback. Um, we have seen those types of reports. Um, the purpose of having someone like a Dr. Fuchs there is to help navigate the system and sometimes to provide feedback to the trainee that in fact, uh, the feedback was, uh, was necessary and a good thing and a learning opportunity. Um, however, there are situations where um, the attending had a bad day, uh, the trainee had a bad day, and there's an opportunity to, to de-escalate a situation uh, through mediation. And this doesn't mean putting both parties in the room across from, a, from each other you know, uh, at a small table. It could be conversations with the individuals back and forth, but uh, an opportunity to uh, recognize, take responsibility for one's uh, behavior in that moment at that time and make it a learning opportunity. And we've had great success with that. However, there are instances where um, there might be the necessity for a formal inquiry. And this is really around the uh, areas where something is considered uh, a formal issue of mistreatment um, and, um, and it requires further investigation. If that is the case, um, there would be a committee of investigation that is established with two faculty members, one senior student. Uh, they would review the details, interviews would be conducted, and a recommendation is made for remediation and discipline. Um, that said, uh, again, to reemphasize the point that uh, what we heard from attendings was a need to hear their side of whatever happened in the incident at the time, and this would be the uh, formal platform to do so. Uh, so what we're hoping to do uh, through this Office for Respectful Environments is be able to um, have a place where the trainees feel they can submit 
their issues um, and that they are supported through it, but um, that it is a very neutral and supportive office for all stakeholders, including attendings. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Leah. Uh, just before, before we get, get off that, I wanna say that this, this system has been set up for students. We're now working on a similar system for residents. Uh, obviously it has to be adapted to the needs of residents which are different. And um, we will be uh, rolling that out in the next uh, little while. Um, we know that um, it's very frustrating for someone to be uh, complained about. Uh, and we, we also know that many of the complaints after the mediation part that Leah alluded to turn out to have been, uh, they go away, if you will. But that being said, there are complaints that are very real and they do end up eventually, unfortunately, in my office, which, uh, which, uh, where we take them very seriously. The other thing that came out of this is that we, we got a lot of feedback that people didn't always understand what we meant by uh, the issues. And you will have seen, you will have all received links. It's on the Our Words Matter website, but links to uh, a learning activity for attendings and residents, and for that matter, for students, on microaggressions. And I encourage you, it's very short. There's a video and it's a very short learning activity, but it's one in, uh, that's well worth doing to give you a feel for what we're talking about and what we, the kind of complaints that we get. Uh, I think if we avoid some of those acti those behaviors, uh, this problem will be less, less severe. So really, what can we do about this other than learning activities and OREs and all this sort of stuff? I actually think that while the faculty and the department and, and, and the hospital have, have an important role in creating the right environment, I really think a lot of effort needs to be done locally. I think, you know, we, are, we work in stressful environments, but we need to somehow be respectful despite the stress. So what can you do as an individual? One thing, of course, is to check in with yourself and take care of yourself. If you're not well, you're not gonna be able to behave at an optimal level. Another issue is I think all of us from students, you know, nurses, doctors, administrators, deans, all of us are functioning in some way as a role model for other people. If people see that we're behaving in a respectful and supportive way, it's much more likely that they're going to behave in a respectful and supportive way. We all know that there's some people who don't, don't take the hint, but most people do. If they see that this is the norm, of how people should behave, they're much more likely to behave that way. I think all of us have to take a second and, and just think before we speak. Think about how what I'm about to, you know, I have to think about what I'm about to say, how it's going to be perceived by the person listening. Not only what I intend, but also how it's going to be received. And this is especially true in a tense working environment. When everybody's relaxed, you can get away with stuff. But if everybody's tense, a remark that seems benign, but said the wrong way, said at the wrong time, said with the wrong tone, might be taken much more severely, but we're human. I, I'll speak for myself. I say things that I shouldn't say, it happens. It is human. If it happens, you have to apologize. I mean, it, it, that can go a long way towards de-escalating the problem before you don't need an office for respectful environments. Sometimes we say something dumb, well, at least I do. And you have to say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, I apologize. That goes a long way. Another thing is, I know we all have to give feedback to learners who maybe aren't doing so well. And that feedback isn't so, everybody loves to give feedback to a superstar. Oh, you're great, you're doing a great job. That's fun. But sometimes you have to give feedback to someone who's not a superstar or they, they're pretty good, but they have one area which is very weak and they really have to work on it. Well, we're gonna be having a, a, another one of these learning activities like the one on microaggressions on feedback. We hope it's coming up soon, but even right now, what you can do is when you get your team at the beginning of a rotation, get to know them, 
in an informal way at the beginning. You know, a lot of, uh, I don't know if it still happens, but when I was uh, very active as an attending, the end of the rotation, we'd go out for lunch or we'd have some event. You might think about having that at the beginning of the rotation because that'll be a chance to get to know um, uh, students or residents that are working with you. You know, it's much easier to get tough feedback from someone you have a relationship with than to get it from someone you just met or you hardly saw during the rotation and the last day they came by to get to, you know, pile crap on your head. Uh, it, it, it really changes the way the same words will be perceived. Another thing to think about are Schwartz rounds or Schwartz type meetings. I know the Department of Medicine has started doing this. So this is a movement that comes from the United States. Uh, Schwartz, I don't think was a doctor, but he, the, the idea is you get everybody on the team together, nurses, doctors, uh, uh, other allied health professionals, uh, learners, uh, uh, the, the ward clerk, everybody is in the room and talk about the, 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 the stressful stuff that's going on where everybody's on the same playing field. People just talk about what it's like, what's going on on this ward, on this service, in this unit. This goes a long way towards um, de-escalating the anxiety that people are feeling because everybody's feeling it. And it seems to result in better relationships between people. So our words matter. How we say things is as important as what we say. Remember, it's not just the person yelling that's a problem, but even just creating an atmosphere that it, it, it makes the learning environment unpleasant has negative effects. So, so it's not all the overt stuff. It's also the more subtle stuff. But of all, all avoid statements that lead learners to question that, you know, this guy hates me no matter what I do. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, my career is over. I'm, my, my, my evaluation is compromised. And make sure that you avoid behaviors that make students feel that they're on the outside. They're not in the club. They're not part of the team. They're not really here. They're just, uh, they're just a nuisance. How can we help? Well, we can speak to each other as the way we would want to be spoken to. It's not a new idea. I think we all have to commit to an environment where everyone feels that they belong and everyone is safe, regardless of their social identity. And I think we have a duty to maintain civil discourse and respect and refrain from personal attacks. Even when we disagree, obviously not everybody's going to agree and obviously there are debates, but we have to refrain from personal attacks. And I, I hate to say it, but we hear from learners that there are many services in which there are personal attacks. Sometimes there are, we've had students fighting with students over, I don't know, global politics, but we've also had attendings fighting with attendings right in front of the students. Okay, that is not a good idea. We have to consider the consequences of what we say because words matter. So in summary, learner mistreatment is a prevalent and very difficult to solve problem. I'm not here to say that I have a magic solution but it's something we can't ignore. Frankly, it's an accreditation risk for, med for the MD program and for many, unfortunately, many of our postgrad programs. And improvement depends on a concerted effort on how we relate to each other. That's true for the, for the faculty's administration, the hospital administration, the attending staff, the learners, it's everybody's responsibility. It's not just, I'm not just here to say, oh, it's the attendings that are, are the problem or the residents are the problem. It's all of us have to uh, make a contribution. So I'm gonna stop there. This is a purpose, uh, on purpose, it's a short, a relatively short talk because I'm hoping that there'll be uh, some opportunity for discussion. And I'm gonna take myself off of this and uh, get thoroughly confused about how to get back to Zoom. Okay, here's Zoom. Whoops. What? Uh, well, this is where I have to call for technical support. Wait a second. Ah, there we go. I saw, at least I see myself. Uh, I'm going to go to. Oh, I can't go to gallery view because if I go to gallery view, it'll be it'll echo. So. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I, I don't know if anybody can monitor. Um, uh, put your hand up 
uh, electronically uh, if you're um, if you want to ask a question. Any questions or comments? Yes, Miguel. Um, great, great, great conversation. Very important one. Uh, I have two comments. One is I uh, am very honored and privileged to be a Harvard fellow. Many of the AMEs and we welcome the fellow group of chief medical students that they have. Not a member, perhaps not the word, but we have a wonderful. Have a wonderful friendship and conversation and trust for voices. I think other fellows should be involved in this. I think it's a good opportunity. Well, you have to press the button for your microphone. I don't think anybody can hear you. I, I don't know where it is. Sorry. Now it's 14 people. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. This is Miguel Bernier speaking. Thank you. I was saying that was a great conversation. This is extremely important. And I was talking about author fellows. And I think author fellows represents an opportunity and they should be involved in a way that I don't know which way it is and is extremely important in my opinion that they are involved because they have a group of students that they, they trust and the group of students trust them and I think is a great way of going to the root of the problem in terms of medical students. Second, I think what's in, most important of all this that I heard today is apologize. If you do something wrong, be ready to say, I'm very sorry. David said that she, he does certain things wrong. I don't know anybody, and he asked my wife, that does more things wrong than I do, but I'm ready to apologize. And that's what I think we have. To, and it's much more difficult. We're not perfect and we're under stress. I'm not, but some people are, and, and we have an environment that is already stressful. Therefore, I think apologizing is a way to do it. And that brings us to think that next time, we're all intelligent. We perhaps should not say that thing. Third thing, and that's for you, it was very interesting what you created and I think is wonderful. Um, young staff, we need to look at them, particularly the ones that are females, the ones that are more prone or more inclined to be discriminated. I think this is important as a group of people that we welcome to our faculty, we welcome in different departments, we welcome in the research institute, and sometimes we don't pay attention to them until three, four, five years later, and it's too long and it's too late. And many of them feel the same way medical students do, same way residents do, graduate students do, and they are a group of people that are very concerned to make a report or have a conversation about this because of the consequences of their future. I think they also should be included. Congratulations to both of you. This is extremely important. And EDI is very, deep, very close to my heart. Thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, Roger Taba has his hand up. Roger, do you want to unmute, please? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation, enjoyed it a lot. Uh, clearly, uh, there must be some individuals that you've uh, that the faculty has been able to identify that are repeat offenders, and how does one go about dealing with them? So I'm smiling because <laughs> because otherwise I'd be crying. Yes, there are such people, and we have a we we spend an inordinate amount of time on them. They are um, um, you know people that eventually end up in my office. And when they end up in my office, it's not very pleasant for, certainly not pleasant for me, but it's not pleasant for them either. Um, we are working hard to address some of those conditions. Those are things that I, I honestly don't think this campaign will fix. I mean, the people who are the repeat offenders who are really nasty and so on, they need special attention. We're trying our best to, to address those. But I can tell you that we've had situations where People have been offending for a long time. Residents and students have known it. They've complained a bit, but not that much because they're afraid. And it sometimes is only at the time of accreditation that we hear the truth. And when we hear the truth, we act. But of course, from the point of view of the learners, it's like, why didn't you do something like uh, five years ago? That's what I hear. Well, uh, these are legitimate complaints on the part that we should have done something five years ago but we didn't necessarily have all the information we needed. So part of the reason for doing this whole campaign 
is to try and make what I'll call good behavior normative. This is what we expect of you. So that the person who is, I'll use the technical term, a jerk, is, stands out from what we expect, right? And is not tolerated not only by the students, but by their peers, right? How many times do we call out a colleague who is behaving badly? Do we take them aside and say, look, you, you, you mustn't do that. I mean, I think, I think that, that we don't wanna build the system for, the, for the, um, the tail of the distribution, but we take the tail of the distribution very, very seriously. It's just that I want all of us to be at our best. I want an environment in which all, all of our behaviors, like our, you know, our, uh, our baseline is very high. Will that get rid of the jerks? No, the jerks need special attention. So Roger, uh, you're absolutely right. There are some, there are some repeat offenders. They, they contribute disproportionately to this problem and we're trying our best to deal with them. Uh, it's a very real uh, situation, but it's, it, it isn't the whole story. Um, I don't know, did I answer your question, Roger? If not, there's a, there's a question here. Um, press the mic, please. Hi, Cynthia Dimitra from General Surgery. I think you've alluded a little bit to that, but the whole fear of retribution uh, in general surgery or in surgery in general, where there's small programs, um, how do we deal with that? Because often sometimes the senior will tell the junior, don't complain, I've complained. I've gotten caught and don't get burned. And it, this fear gets passed on to the to the uh, junior residents and then yeah. it just escalates like snowball effect. So I've been told that by the fact, by residents in general surgery, but residents in other programs, not just, it's not special. This is not unique to general surgery. I don't want to give that impression. We will not tolerate this behavior. If we find out that someone has uh, an attending, because I have a power or a resident is, is, preventing people from, you know, is, is threatening retribution, we will, we will throw the book at them. Okay. I mean, I, I have heard now of some pretty egregious examples of what you just described and they're just not acceptable. We can't have a culture of intimidation. You know, I know that um, there's like a cartoon about surgical disciplines, you know, uh, TV shows and, and so on. But I, I know for a fact in this faculty, we have some surgical disciplines where the learning environment is actually quite good. And the residents don't complain at all. I mean, they complain that they're hard, it's hard work. And, you know, I was on call, all the usual things, but they don't have this problem. And we have other disciplines, again, some are surgical, but not only surgical ones, where these complaints are constant. So it's not, it's not intrinsic to surgery. Okay. Because if it were, it would be all surgical disciplines. It's not. It's not even intrinsic to general surgery. It's, it's not intrinsic to internal medicine where we've had similar problems. There are local issues with maybe particular people or maybe a learned culture. You know, what you're talking about is culture. Changing culture is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult and it takes a long time. This effort, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm just finished. This effort we're doing is part of culture change on a large scale. But of course, the most important thing is culture change on a local scale. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, as an attending, like a CTU director, how do we, like, what are the skill sets that we can learn or apply so to, to improve that? Uh, I understand it's not permitted, but it is happening. So how do we prevent that day in, day out? That's an excellent question. I'm, I'm we're still discovering how to do that. I would be lying if I said I had the answer to that. I think part of the answer is to be very clear in our messaging that this is not acceptable. That's the first, like that's a, it's not enough, but it's a first step. I think, uh, frankly, if we find people who are doing this, we will, um, we will make an example so that it becomes quite clear that this is a high risk behavior to, to say things like that, 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 that there's no um, tolerance of this kind of thing. Not because we want to be mean, but because it's just not right. It's not fair. There are times where you know, residents do things that are completely wrong and they need to be corrected. I'm not here to say, oh, everything a resident does is great or everything a resident says is worth, uh, you know, is wonderful. It's not true. But I am here to say that we have to find ways of correcting resident uh, errors or student errors and remembering their learners 
and doing it in a respectful way. Even if sometimes residents have to fail a rotation. I mean, it happens. I'm not suggesting that we just so, oh, whatever they do is okay. But I am, I am saying that they, we have to find a way of doing it that it respects them as human beings while being honest about their performance. I mean, it, it, it's very difficult. And the response when a resident complains about something is not to say, well, if you complain, uh, you know, I'm going to ruin your career or, you know, things like that. Because I've heard these people say that. that, that, that doesn't work. And if someone does that, you know, it's going to be very hard for that person to have a career in this, in this, in this, at least from the university side. I don't control the hospital side, but from the university side, people who do that are, are not going to get promoted. They're not going to, they're not going to get um, um, any senior positions. I mean, they're not going to have a, much of a career. I can't, you know, in, in Canada, <laughs> when someone has a job in a hospital, it's really hard to make them, make them leave. My brother works at Cleveland Clinic in Florida. <laughs> if, someone is, if someone does that, what you describe, they're uninvited the next year to every, their contract is terminated. I can't terminate people's contracts. So, I, so we have to use moral suasion uh, and encourage people. I don't want to be negative. I mean, we've been talking about sanctions, but I would rather be positive. I would rather people to see all around them that we have a positive environment and that they want to be part of that positive environment. Um, uh, I, you know, Roger made the point about the repeat offenders and so on. They exist. But I want those people to feel, you know, why am I doing this? I'm so weird compared to everybody else. That's, that's my hope. Is it naive? Probably. But at least we can try. You know, I mean, I really think we, we want to emphasize a positive. I, today I've presented the problem, but I think the solution is to, to treat each other as we would want to be treated. I don't think the attending who, who, or the resident who says, well, don't do that because you, know, you get in trouble and tries to intimidate somebody. I don't think they would like to be treated like that. Right? So uh, Roger has said, <laughs> I guess I triggered. Uh, I, had, uh, a, I had a particularly, uh, I had an encounter with a particularly malignant attending going back to the late 1970s. Yeah. And uh, this individual is well known for abusing medical students. And the chief of service on the first day of the rotation said uh, to the students, gathered them together and said, you're welcome to all the activities within this service. We want you to participate in clinics and ORs and lectures, et cetera. But you are to have nothing to do with Dr. X. And as a result, uh, he was sort of frozen out. Uh, I don't know if he gave the same lecture to the residents on the service, but certainly uh, the students had nothing to do with Dr. X. It was sort of one way of isolating him. Well, we, we will be, we have, and we will be in the future um, taking similar measures very formally for certain individuals who are uh, just not treating the learners properly. But uh, I also had those experiences, but when I had them, nobody said, <laughs> I won't, I won't say more because I, I, the older people in the audience will all know who I'm talking about as soon as I describe the situation. RV Sigmund has his hand up. Uh, that was an excellent talk, uh, David. Uh, I would like to send one single important message that it's so much easier to learn when you're having fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so clear. That is it. And, and it's also so much easier to teach when you're having fun. You're right. You're right. I mean, it's not only to learn, it's also to teach. It's so much easier to do everything when you're having fun. We can't always have fun, though, Harvey. Let's be honest. There are times where things are tough. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to remember that, uh, that, that, that in between the tough times, there's opportunities for, for fun, for uh, collegiality and for uh, uh, warm relationships between people. Um, Kevin, I think I've used up my time. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and uh, we'll have rounds again next week. Thank you.